Early in the war, the Lincoln administration recognized the importance of keeping the border state of Kentucky in the Union. On September 3, 1861, the Confederates broke the Commonwealth's self-declared neutrality when Brigadier General Gideon J. Pello, acting on the orders of Major General Lee Nidus Polk, occupied the city of Columbus. With Kentucky now unwillingly dragged into the conflict, the state would find itself at the epicenter of a new Western theater. With the Commonwealth now invaded, the Confederates formed the Army of Central Kentucky, commanded by Albert Sidney Johnston. Considered by many to be the South's premier general at the time, General Johnston soon consolidates his invasion force, holding Western Kentucky with his headquarters at Columbus, his Major General's Polk Command. In the center, Brigadier General Simon Bolivar Buckner's command is headquartered at Bowling Green. Meanwhile, Brigadier General Felix K. Zollicoffer's brigade guards the Confederate right flank at the Cumberland Gap, a pass through the Appalachian Mountains where the states of Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee all converge. As the doorway leading to the frontiers of the West, the Cumberland Gap is one of the most significant pieces of land in American history, and its strategic importance is not lost on either side. The Cumberland Gap can be used as an avenue of invasion offering Union armies the opportunity to strike south into eastern Tennessee or allowing a Confederate army to strike north into Kentucky. When General Zollicoffer seizes the Cumberland Gap following the collapse of Kentucky's neutrality, the General is not content to remain on the defensive. He quickly advances his command from eastern Tennessee into the Bluegrass State to skirmish with the Union forces there. The Federal troops being engaged by Zollicoffer's brigade are under the command of Brigadier General George Henry Thomas, a career army officer. Thomas is also a Southerner, a Virginian who had chosen to remain loyal to the Union. Zollicoffer moves into Kentucky on November 27, 1861, advancing to Mill Springs on the south side of the Cumberland River. During this time spent at Mill Springs, Zollicoffer has about 3,500 men at his disposal, although many of them are unarmed, while others have only old flintlock muskets or civilian shotguns. After skirmishing with some of the Federals near Somerset, Zollicoffer reports to headquarters that his men have crossed the Cumberland with little difficulty on flatboats they have constructed. Several days later, on December 5th, without permission from higher command, Zollicoffer shifts his entire brigade over the river to Beach Grove, just north of Mill Springs. There, the Confederates set about building cabins and establishing winter camp. Even though he has a river to his back, Zollicoffer believes that Beach Grove is a defensible position, and since it places his troops closer to the Federals at Somerset, he can better respond to enemy movements. By this time, Zollicoffer has little over 1,600 men under his command in seven infantry regiments, two seven-gun artillery batteries, and three battalions and four companies of cavalry. While Zollicoffer is crossing the Cumberland and starting work to establish winter camps at Beech Grove, his superior, Major General George B. Crittenden, commander of the District of East Tennessee, headquartered at Knoxville, discovers that Zollicoffer has relocated to the far side of the Cumberland and is dismayed. He immediately orders Zollicoffer to withdraw back across the south side of the river. Crittenden realizes that if the Federals consolidate their forces and move against Zollicoffer, the Tennessean would be in trouble with his back against the river. Meanwhile, on December 29th, Major General Don Carlos Buell, commanding general of the Union Army of the Ohio, orders his army's first division under Brigadier General Thomas to drive Zollicoffer out of Kentucky. And so, on New Year's Eve, Thomas moves out against the Confederates. He takes with him his second brigade, consisting of the 4th Kentucky, 10th Kentucky, 10th Indiana, and the 14th Ohio, as well as two regiments from another brigade, the 2nd Minnesota and the 9th Ohio. Joining those two infantry units are the 1st Kentucky Cavalry and Battery C 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Although Thomas's force starts moving off in high spirits, bad weather and terrible roads soon make the march miserable. It starts to rain, then sleet, before the dirt roads turn to mud. Over the almost impassable muddy roads, it takes 18 exhausting days for Thomas's force to make a march that most men had expected would only last three. Finally, on January 17th, the exhausted Union forces' advance guard reaches Logan's Crossroads, about 10 miles north of Zollicoffer's position at Beach Grove, and 8 miles west of Somerset. 
While Thomas waits for the rest of his force to converge on Logan's crossroads, he sends word to Brigadier General Alban F. Sheff to send him three regiments in an artillery battery from Somerset. Meanwhile, Crittenden, worried about the situation on Zollicoffer's front, left Knoxville and reaches Mill Springs on January 3rd. Upon his arrival, Crittenden is shocked to find Zollicoffer still at Beech Grove on the north side of the Cumberland River. Crittenden's immediate impulse is to move Zollicoffer's men back across the south side of the river, but the same rainstorms that have bogged down the Federal March has also swollen the Cumberland, making its currents fast and rough. So Crittenden decides to have Zollicoffer stay put on the north side of the river, making the choice to launch a preemptive strike on Thomas's Federals at Logan's Crossroads before they can unite with Chef's force at Somerset. Crittenden knows that the fishing creek around Logan's Crossroad is running at high levels due to the recent rains, and he hopes that the stream will prove an obstacle to the separate Union lines for a few days. On January 19, 1862, the first significant battle of the Western Theater is ready to unfold at Mill Springs and Logan's Crossroads. After marching for six hours through a cold rain that turns the road into a sea of mud, the vanguard of the Confederate force arrives near Logan's Crossroads at 6.30 a.m. on January 19th, at the foot of a ridge a mile and a half from the crossroads. The advanced Confederate cavalry meets a strong picket force from Thomas's 10th Indiana Infantry and 1st Kentucky Cavalry Regiments, far from being surprised at their camps. The Federals were on the watch and this picket force stubbornly resists the Confederate advance up the hill. When they reach the high ground, the Union pickets are reinforced by the rest of the 10th Indiana, and this force stands its ground against the advancing rebels. Critter then advances with Zollicoffer's own brigade in the lead. General Zollicoffer places the 15th Mississippi in line of battle moving up the road, with his other regiments following close behind. This force is sufficient to push the Federals off the hill and into the woods below. However, the dawn is dark and misty, and the Confederates are spread out for miles along the narrow, muddy road, slowing their advance. After fighting for nearly an hour on their own, the 10th Indiana Infantry and the 1st Kentucky Cavalry are almost out of ammunition and in danger of being overrun. They fall back to a rail fence bordering a cornfield on a low ridge running perpendicular to the road. Here, they are finally reinforced by the 4th Kentucky, and this split rail fence and ridge forms the basis for the main federal battle line. The 10th Indiana falls back a short distance to regroup, and the troopers of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry dismount, send their horses to the rear, and fall in besides their infantry comrades in the 4th Kentucky. Unable to push this force further back, the 15th Mississippi begins to move to the right under the cover of a deep wooded ravine. From here, they can approach the Federal lines before engaging their enemy at close range. This infuriates the commander of the 4th Kentucky, Colonel Speed S. Fry, who climbs up on the split rail fence and brandishes his sword at the enemy, demanding they stand and fight like men. The Mississippians are eager to oblige him. After advancing nearly to the ridgeline on the west of the road, Almost flanking the Union troops on their right, the Confederate advance stalls. Most of the rebel soldiers had never been in battle before. In the dark, rainy morning, coupled with the smoke and din of battle, and the lack of visibility in the dense woods produces quite a bit of confusion. Brigadier General Zollicoffer leading his brigade from the front with the 19th Tennessee is sure that his men are firing on another Confederate regiment, and he rides forward onto the road in order to reconnoiter. There, he meets Colonel Fry of the 4th Kentucky, who had rode up to his right for the exact same purpose. Neither recognizes the other, with Zollicoffer said to have been nearsighted, and his own uniform is hidden from Colonel Fry's view by a raincoat. Zollicoffer orders Fry to cease firing on his fellow friendly troops. Colonel Fry, assuming that Brigadier General Zollicoffer is a federal officer whom he does not know, and also unsure of who the troops to his right are, answers that he would never intentionally fire on a friendly unit. As Fry moves back toward his own regiment, Captain Henry M. R. Fogg of Zollicoffer's staff suddenly rides out of the woods to warn the general, firing his pistol at Fry. Colonel Fry and the Union soldiers near him immediately return the fire, and Brigadier General Zollicoffer falls dead on the road, along with Captain Fogg. 
Felix K. Zollicoffer has just become the first general officer killed in the Civil War's Western Theater. General Zollicoffer's death throws his troops on that part of the field into confusion, and with no brigade commander to lead them, they make no further significant advances on the west side of the road. However, the 15th Mississippi and the 20th Tennessee regiments launch a series of furious attacks on Colonel Fry's position, with some assaults even managing to reach the split rail fence, where they fight the Federals hand to hand. Bayonets are poked through the fence rails and the Mississippians attack swinging their long cane knives. The Confederates begin to move ever toward their right, threatening to turn the Federal left flank. However, a section of the Union guns from Battery C, 1st Ohio Light Artillery appear at the crucial moment and start throwing shells at the Confederates. At the same time, the 2nd Minnesota and the 9th Ohio regiments arrive to bolster the Federal defenses. The Union forces now have over four regiments at the point of action, opposing three Confederate regiments in direct combat with their enemy, less than ideal odds for the Southerners. For over an hour, the 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee battle the Federals almost completely alone. Captain Arthur M. Rutledge's Tennessee Battery fires a few rounds, and the 25th and 28th Tennessee regiments move up to reinforce the Southern troops fighting on the front line. But Crittenden is never able to bring up the rest of his infantry and bring all his forces to bear upon the Union, nor does he make use of his cavalry for any flanking movements. The Confederates are further demoralized by the failure of many of their weapons to fire in the intermittent rain. Most of the Confederate force, particularly the Tennessee regiments, are armed with obsolete flintlock muskets. Only the 15th Mississippi, 16th Alabama, and 29th Tennessee are partially armed with percussion cap muskets and rifles. One participant estimates that only a fifth of the Confederates' muskets would fire. In their frustration, many of the Tennesseans are seen smashing their useless flintlocks against trees. In contrast to the rebels, the Federals are finally able to concentrate their forces. The Union 1st and 2nd Tennessee and the 12th Kentucky arrive to outflank and outnumber the hard-fighting 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee. General Thomas, seeing the imminent collapse of the Confederate line, orders a general advance of the Union force. The 9th Ohio, a German volunteer regiment from Cincinnati, charges the Confederates with fixed bayonets. The Southerners' left flank crumbles under the weight of the 9th Ohio's bayonet charge, and the 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee are forced to retreat to keep from being surrounded. The courageous Lt. Bailey Payton Jr., commanding a company in the 20th Tennessee, is killed when he refuses to retreat or surrender, but had stood firing his pistol at the advancing enemy. The entire Union line soon advances, forcing what is left of the Confederate Army back to the top of the hill from which they had attacked. Here, the 16th Alabama and 17th and 29th Tennessee regiments open up a heavy volley fire on the Federals, momentarily halting the Union pursuit and allowing the frontline Confederate units to safely retreat. But for most of the Southern soldiers, their retreat quickly turns into a panicked rout. Many of the men simply turn and run, throwing away their muskets and other implements of war in their haste to escape capture by the Union. Their courage and determination are simply not enough to overcome their fatigue from marching all night over muddy roads and fighting since dawn. Their despair when their outmoded flintlocks refuse to fire in the rain and the confusion and lack of decisive leadership at their command level. After some three or four hours of hard fighting on a dark, rainy morning, the Battle of Mill Springs or Battle of Logan's Crossroads is finally over. The outmatched Southerners withdraw back down the road toward their camps. They proceed to rally at their Beech Grove entrenchments, but Brigadier General Thomas arrives with his forces in the afternoon and promptly opens up a bombardment on the Confederate camp, including a steamboat at the ferry on the river below. This fire comes from the rifled guns of Battery B, 1st Ohio Light Artillery, which the Southerners' artillery cannot match in range or accuracy. With their backs to the Cumberland River, this steamboat becomes the Confederates' only lifeline for any withdrawal. Recognizing that his position is untainable, Major General Crittenden orders a withdrawal across the river that night. The Confederates proceed to leave behind all their artillery pieces and supply wagons, as well as most of their horses and camp equipment. When dawn on January 20th arrives and the Federals move against the Confederate earthworks, 
they find the camp is abandoned and General Crittenden's force is safely across the river. The Union forces report 246 casualties for the battle, including 39 killed in action. The Confederates suffer 533 casualties, including more than 120 killed. The bodies of Brigadier General Zollicoffer and Lieutenant Peyton are treated with respect and are returned to their families, who have them buried with honor in Nashville. The remaining Southern dead are left on the field to be buried in mass graves, many near the site of General Zollicoffer's death. The Union victory at the Battle of Mill Springs proves a joyful occasion in Northern newspapers. It was the first good news of a major victory for the North in the war. The victory at Mill Springs cracks the Southern defensive line in Kentucky and opens up Tennessee to federal invasion. However, the good news from Mill Springs is soon overshadowed by an even more decisive victory a few weeks later on the Cumberland River at Fort Donelson, Tennessee.